On behalf of Ambassador Syed Akbaruddin, permanent representative of India to the United Nations, welcome all of you to this very special event today. As we commemorate the second International Day of Yoga tomorrow at the United Nations, we are delighted that so many of you could join us today for this very special conversation with two very distinguished yoga masters. Uh, we will try today to explore the links between the practice and philosophy of yoga and the achievement of sustainable development goals. Before we begin our formal program, I'd like to invite you to witness this small video presentation on the International Day of Yoga. On 27th September 2014, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi proposed an International Day of Yoga at the United Nations General Assembly. Today, I would like to draw your attention to another subject. When we talk about climate change, when we talk about holistic health care, when we talk about unity with nature, when we talk about getting back to basics, I would like to say something special about this subject. Yoga is our ancient, traditional and invaluable gift. Yoga symbolizes the balance of body and mind, thought and action, achievement and self-control, and the coming together of human beings and nature. Yoga aims at transformation of our lifestyle, and its awareness can help us in our struggle against climate change. Yoga it means to us a unity and love. Start practice yoga and I feel your life become more colorful and meaningful. In India I started to have a glimpse of the real yoga, that union of ourselves to the divine. The practice of yoga brings about balance, well-being, happiness, and the freedom to live life fully. As more and more people take up yoga around the world today, we may actually see the beginning of a global shift in consciousness, leading to a more balanced and harmonious planet. Yoga practitioners become more conscious consumers, better human beings, more environmentally conscious, and good leaders. This is the power of yoga, and it can only be good for the world. Let us work towards making a beginning in this direction with an international day of yoga. On 11th December 2014, the United Nations passed a resolution making 21st June the International Day of Yoga. 177 nations co-sponsored the resolution a record in UN history. To start, to start the proceedings, may I now request Ambassador Syed Akbaruddin, permanent representative of India to the United Nations, to give his welcoming remarks. Sir. Respected Sadhguruji, Madam Tao, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends from the United Nations and from outside, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this very special event today. As you are well aware, tomorrow, 
June 21st is the International Day of Yoga. In fact, tomorrow will be the second time that the International Day of Yoga is being commemorated the world over. The UN General Assembly decided on 11th December 2014 to proclaim June 21st as this International Day of Yoga. In doing so, the international community wholeheartedly responded to a call made by Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi in his maiden address to the United Nations General Assembly on 27th September 2014. While the commemoration of the International Day of Yoga has so far focused on popularizing yoga's contribution to health and well-being, this event today is perhaps the first time that we have a purely intellectual discussion on the potential contribution of yoga in moving the world to a more sustainable pathway. Yoga, after all, is much more than a physical regimen. Even though most of us are associated with it as, a physical, as physical postures and breathing exercises, at its core, yoga is as much about mindful thought as it is about mindful action. One of the oldest scriptures on yoga, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali describes yoga as, in Sanskrit, yoga chit vritti nirodhana, or yoga is the suppression of the fluctuations of the mind. It is about stilling the consciousness and controlling mind's usual impulses. At the same time, yoga is equally about action. It has been described simply as yoga karmasu kaushalam. In other words, yoga is skillfulness in action. Both these aspects, mindful thought and mindful action, have a direct bearing on our collective response to global problems, something that we are trying to address through the Sustainable Development Goals. To delve into this intellectual side of yoga and to relate it to the political vision we have collectively set ourselves in the form of the SDGs, we are delighted to have with us two very distinguished yoga masters. Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev is perhaps one of the most well-known teachers of yoga. He is not just a realized mystic himself, but is also an acclaimed speaker who is known for his gift of conveying complex ideas and thoughts in simple and powerful language. Sadhguru has said, yoga is the science of enhancing perception. How then do we bring this science to bear, not just on personal perception, but to global consciousness, the consciousness of the SDGs, which is about bringing positive change in our world to make it a better place to live for all of us as people and also for our future generations. I am sure he will enlighten us on this and other questions in his inimitable way. We also have with us an amazing person and Ms. Thai Porchon Lynch, who at 97 years is a young practitioner of yoga. She is someone whose life itself is in many ways an embodiment of the practice of yoga, of simplicity, positive thinking, and a sense of oneness with nature. We are equally delighted that two distinguished guests have joined us to participate in the conversation with the two yoga masters. Mr. Max Kennedy is a well-known author and an activist with a distinguished public career. Mr. Kennedy also serves on the board of Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is, in a matter of speaking, the Development Bank of the United States. He will be talking to Sadhguruji on his perspective of yoga. The conversation with Ms. Tai Porchon Lynch will be moderated by her student and biographer, Ms. Teresa K. Abba Kennedy, who is, who is a Harvard Business School strategist and author, 
a yoga practitioner, and a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. And just if you are wondering, no, Max and Teresa are not related. Let's just say it's some kind of a yogic coincidence that both the conversationalists today are Kennedys. Without much ado, let me once again thank each one of you for joining us today. There is much to learn from the two yoga masters, and I am as eager as all of you to listen to them. Thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent introduction to our discussion, sir. Uh, we'll get the first of the two conversations started now, and to doing that, uh, may I request uh, Tao Po Chong Lynch and uh, Teresa Kennedy to take their places on the dais. And while they are doing so, let's look at this video presentation. Is that our music of Zen? Zen. It is. Okay. So she's a former dancer, model, and actress, and for the past three years has been recognized as the world's oldest living yoga teacher. Tao Porshan Lynch has been bending, stretching, and breathing her way into longevity since the Coolidge presidency. But her positive message today, it's really timeless. Beautiful. Meet the real life Forrest Gump. Listen to your heartbeat. Born in India in 1918, Tao moved to France as a young woman. She had early success in modeling for famed designers like Coco Chanel. But when World War II broke out, she found herself drawn into the resistance against Nazi Germany. And it was then that she realized the power of positive change in teaching yoga to others. I think really and truly the nicest thing that I can accomplish is when somebody says they can't do something and I show them they can. She toured the U.S. and even wrote over 300 film scripts, combining a career in show business with her love of yoga and call to social activism. She's walked with Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., but she credits her uncle, who raised her, with teaching her compassion and acceptance. Never look down on anybody. Know that even a farmer may be illiterate in uh, education, but he knows more about the soil than you do. So you're illiterate about the soil. What is your secret to success in life? So when I wake up in the morning, I say, this is going to be the best day of my life. You really say that to yourself? Yes. Whatever you put in your mind materializes. Mm -hmm. So don't materialize anything negative. Mm -hmm. Materialize everything positive. She's broken her wrist and had three hip replacements. But Tao doesn't count the injuries or even the years. And she has no intention of slowing down. I'm not interested in what I can't do. Nothing's impossible. In fact, Tao learned to dance when she was 85. Since then, she won more than 700 first place dance prizes, even traveling to countries as far away as India, where she danced with Sandeep Sopakar, a famed Bollywood choreographer. She's a gift, and I think whoever has come across her, they all feel blessed about her. Tao has inspired people all over the world, young or old. She makes quite an impression on her students. A little girl, six years old, said to me, Tao, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, I'm not going to retire. I said, I'm going to dance my way to the next planet. In the next half hour, you're going to meet a man. She's, she's going to dance her way to the next planet. Uh, excellencies, ambassadors, distinguished delegates and guests, Sadhguru, Max Kennedy, uh, thank you for your graciousness, for inviting us here uh, for this landmark discussion on yoga and the sustainable development goals. Please join me in welcoming again my teacher and mentor, Tao Porshan Lynch. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? That's how Tao's uncle started every morning, modeling the behavior of right thinking and right living. Through his example, he taught Tao that we can choose good 
and seek union with all that is. And that is yoga. So Tao, your uncle Vital Porshan was a student of Swami Vivekananda who is credited to bringing yoga to the West. And you absorbed the ethical precepts of yoga from him. Uh, ahimsa, uh, you know, compassion of all living things, satya, truthfulness. Uh, what was the greatest lesson from your uncle? Never to ask people to understand you. Always try and understand them. When you go out in this world, think twice about what you're going to say. Sorry. I'm not very good at, with these microphones. And my, my uncle took me all over the world. He uh, uh, actually, from the time I was a little girl, uh, he was there to help me uh, to face life. He had some very strange ideas, and um, uh, he was liked by everyone. I would see people coming to see him and ask his advice. And uh, so I, I met a lot of people. Um, I met Prime Minister, he wasn't Prime Minister then, but Nero. I um, also, one day I happened to walk into my house and I saw a little gentleman sitting on the floor with glasses on looking like this, and um, I didn't understand why everyone was touching his toes. And so I thought, better not ask any questions at the moment. But three weeks later, my uncle said to me, I want you to get a case together. And what you're going to put in it, you're not going to uh, put any uh, beautiful dresses and things, just underwear and some fresh tops. I said, why? He said, I'm taking you on a long trip. I said, where am I going? Oh, you'll see. That was when I met Mahatma Gandhi. He was the gentleman sitting on the floor with everyone touching his toes. Would, this was when I marched with him and saw a bit the horrors of war, even the war of people between each other. And um, I'm going to uh, interrupt you, Tao. I have permission to interrupt, Tao. We travel the world doing conversations. So that was the 1930 Salt March. Yeah. Uh, and share with us what you learned from Gandhi. You, you said that he, he decorates the walls of your mind. What did he leave with you and that you actually live today? I think uh, not to be afraid. When you believe in something, go and do it. You will never get in trouble uh, as far as yourself is concerned, but go out and accept life and don't be afraid. And I never was. He, uh, I've, I faced the, uh, the war. I decided to go and uh, face the war. I wasn't afraid. I, maybe this is silly because now I'm facing life and everyone is telling me, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. But quite frankly, what Gandhi taught me has been with me all my life. Never ask anybody to understand you. You understand them. I'm, not, I'm a little bit shaky, but I hope you'll forgive me. So a sense of fearlessness, which you carried through, you know, in the war as a French resistance fighter, uh, helping people escape the Nazis, uh, as an actress, as a model. And, and while you were living fully in the world, you studied with a who's who of spiritual leaders. So Sri Aurobindo, uh, since you were little, he was a friend of your uncle. Uh, and then BKS Iyengar, you convinced him to start teaching women. 
uh, Patabi Joyce, Maharishi, Dr. Roman Astoya. So from all of these influences as a backdrop, what is yoga? What, what's yoga? What is yoga? What is yoga? It's the oneness behind all things that brings people together. It, and it really works. When you're, when you're tuning in, yoga is to take a deep breath inside of you. And when you feel inside of you, your heart beating, you're opening up the door to life. You're opening up the door to your innermost self, to the power that's within you and which is within all creatures. So uh, I think I, that is one of the major things. Never be afraid, but always tune in. And as you listen to your own heartbeat, you don't have to pray to something in space. The Lord of all creation is already right inside of you. And you have to put it into practice. And yoga is one way of moving into that inner self. To take a breath this very moment and know that every single person in this room is tuning in to their inner self. And sometimes, this is a silly little remark, but also I was teaching yoga in Kripal, and suddenly I saw seven gentlemen in my class, and they were digging around like this. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, there's a bug. I said, so what? Well, we're trying to kill it. I said, you're not going to kill it in my class that tiny little creature that's on the floor that you can't even get to is beating you, has the same heartbeat as you do. And they looked at me a little shocked, and uh, they said, but we have to kill it. I said, no, nobody kills anything when they're with me. I believe that it doesn't matter uh, whether I was once a child and I was listening to the grass grow. And my aunt thought I was a little bit nutty. And there said, she said, told my uncle, I think there's something wrong with her. He said, no, even that blade of grass had to take a breath to pierce the, the earth and become what it is today. And so I've learned always no matter what the situations, never be afraid, but tune in to your inner self and there's, you will find that there's nothing you can't do. Never procrastinate or put things off until tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. One minute after midnight is already today. So when you want to do something, just go out and do it if you believe in it. And so I try to use that theory when I'm doing yoga. When people are telling me, oh, you're getting old, I don't believe them. I look at all the trees around me that are hundreds of years old. And that same energy that's in that tree is recycled every year. So I'm recycling my own inner self. And I'm learning to live. And I, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit crazy with my explanation. <laughs> Forgive me. No. <laughs> so so you, when you were young, you were listening to the grass grow. So you've always had this oneness with nature. You've been a big environmentalist all of your life. And when people ask you about meditation, uh, what your practice is, you often say, my life is my meditation. What does that mean? Well, words are cheap. They really are. You can explain a lot of things with words. Practice is what you must do. And uh, I feel that whatever I believe in, I don't want to spend time, uh, you know, with thinking of all the things that can go wrong because you're materializing it. So when I wake up every morning, I say, this is going to be the best day of my life. And you know something now, if you go to um, Jamaica or anywhere, they have this 
thing where they said, Tao says, this is going to be the best day of my life. And they start to chant it. It's ridiculous, really. I just want to show people, don't be afraid. The power inside of you is there. But don't spend, don't waste your time thinking about it. Think only the good, and you will materialize the good. And that's my feeling of how to live my life. I try to do it all the time. Well, I, I, I travel with you a, a lot, and you do. Um, Dr. Deepak Chopra said of you, one of the most acclaimed yoga teachers of our century, a mentor to me. Like yoga, she teaches us to have exquisite awareness in every moment. Uh, and, and that noticing, that heightened awareness is mindfulness and is yoga. And you often say that breath can be a gateway to peace. If we can breathe together, we can be together. Talk about breath for a moment. Well, a lot of people take a breath, but actually all they do is go like that. To me, when you're taking a breath, tune in. And sometimes in my class, I let people stay on their tummy and just tune in. I don't want to tune into space. I want to tune into inside of me. Let it reveal itself. How can I get through it? It, it actually works, you know. Uh, honestly, I've had a few people who told me they were going to commit suicide. And they, they, that they, were, the fam they wanted the family to give in to them. And I said, you have no... Why are you committing suicide? What are you trying to avoid? Are you trying to avoid the faces of people? I, I just go and know that you can turn around everything. We need to bring the oneness of life into our whole being, into the way we live, into to know that even the people we don't like very much, <laughs> we can uh, don't clutter up our mind with that, but know that they, I can reach inside them and maybe touch them one day and we can learn from each other that there is a oneness and it's very important. So, so you, can, you can share a breath together. So at almost 98 years old, Tao can still hold her body up on her fingertips in a raised lotus position. Uh, and in the last six months, you've been to Mumbai, Dubai, Slovenia, Montenegro, the Bahamas. Uh, last June, you danced on America's Got Talent. Uh, next month, you're doing a, a dance championship in Las Vegas. And then in August, we'll be in Paris to film Francis Got Talent. So you seem to have boundless energy. And you've said, in my head, I'm still in my 20s, and I have no intention of ever growing up. So has yoga, how has yoga helped you with your own vitality, mentally and physically? Well, it's, it's very easy to sit and talk like this for here. How many of us are really breathing deeply inside of us? That's the whole truth. Know that within you is the power behind all things. And that power will actually open up and show you the path to how to live and how to face your problems and how to get together. I spend so much time listening to people who are always sitting there like this. And one of them said to me, oh, well, it's all right at your age. And I said to her, how old are you? Well, I'm, I'm 72. And someone told me another thing. I said, well, that's all right then. You're, you're my children. So let's all do it together and know that nothing is impossible. Within you is the power to do everything. Never say, I can or cannot. You only count, you know, fruit, fruit and vegetables. The verb is to be able. Go out and do what you feel inside of you. Don't just think about it. Materialize it. Put it into action. It works. It really does. Because you don't know how scared I was coming here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tao, Tao. You are an example of 
what almost a century of conscious living looks like. And if we, as leaders, live yoga and model mindfulness and sustainability as you do, then we will make decisions with heightened awareness uh, and, and create a more harmonious world. So thank you very much for your insights. And I'll let you close with a, with a shanti or a shalom. Well, let just as we, as we all sit here, just a little thing. A little boy said to me, I was teaching some Kung Fu children, three to six and of six to 12. And suddenly I had a little boy come up to me and he said to me, Tao, I agree with you completely. We must bring the oneness in the schools together. And in my classes, his mother tried to pull him away from me, so he went around the back and continued on the other side. He said, because in my school, I am adopting a oneness program. And I said, that's very good. And he said, will you help me? I said, yes, of course. You get up, and whatever you have in mind, you put down, and you try and do it. Don't spend your, a waste of time thinking about things that you don't do. That it's, words are cheap, but go, whatever you believe in, start the day with that. It's going to be the best day of my life, and I'm passing it on to everybody. That's the only thing I feel. I wake up in the morning, and I look at the birds, and I look at all the animals that I adore, and I'd rather they have food than I do. So I have a half a grapefruit. <laughs> and if my friends and my students can make, get me to eat more, they try to take me out. You have pure mm -hmm. prana, so you don't need it. So, well, with you in the room, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? So thank you again for sharing your insights. <laughs>Well, thank you. That was a delightful conversation. Thank you, Terry. And of course, thank you so much, Tao. Uh, may I request Tao to uh, take her seat again? We'll, of course, invite you back when we open the floor for questions. Uh, but for the second conversation now, uh, moving on, uh, may I invite uh, on the dais, Sadhguruji, and also Max, Mr. Maxwell Kennedy, to take their seats on the dais. Thank you. And while they do so, let's uh, look at this video presentation as well. In the next half hour, you're going to meet a man who has a devoted following across India and indeed around the world. While yoga and meditation are at the core of his teachings to promote individual growth, the work of the foundation covers conservation, education and health. And you'll find him astonishingly pragmatic on a range of very modern day problems. Let's meet Sadhguru. For the very first time in the history of humanity, we have the necessary resource, we have the necessary capability, we have the necessary technology to address every human problem on the planet. Even 25 years ago, we couldn't have dreamt of it. But the only thing that is missing is consciousness. Today, the spotlight is on a project called Green Hands in India. We started a mass campaign and uh, six years I spent planting trees in people's heads. That's the most difficult terrain, believe me. And now in the last six years we've been transplanting it and that's happening much more easily. Action for Rural Rejuvenation is mainly aimed at rejuvenating the human spirit. English and computer skills are very essential to make these children come out of the hopeless economic and social pit they are in. If you could first tell our viewers what is the idea behind it, initiative, insight, which is more specific towards entrepreneurs, Whatever the nature of your business, ultimately, it is all about human well-being. 
Isha Foundation, a non-religious, non-profit public service organization headquartered in southern India. We've engineered the outside world in so many ways, but we've done nothing about this one. If you want to know well-being, in is the only way out. This is what I want to teach you too, that is, you can be completely intoxicated without any drug, just on life. This is a shift from wine to divine. How can you love one and hate the other when the same divine exists in all? The spiritual process is not about looking up or looking down, it is about turning inward. See, the only thing that I'm really good at is just this. I can just make the air around me just crackle with energy. If you have to describe yourself in one word, would you consider uh, wildlife as two words or one word? Yes. Jananam Sukadham Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalevasha Sakalam Karunam Samaya Depate Akilam Karunam Good afternoon, everybody, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Sadhguru, and good afternoon to Your Excellencies and distinguished guests and to uh, all the meditators who are watching on the internet right now. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, and, uh, and it's such a privilege, really, to be here. My name is Maxwell Kennedy, and um, I've been, I learned how to meditate from Sadhguru a few years ago. And um, so we're here at the United Nations, and there are Four, maybe 40 or 60 ambassadors here in 70 different countries and 7,000 people, and we're here to talk about sustainable development. So why did you start with a chant? <laughs> <laughs> the chant is uh, an invocation. An invocation means uh, to perform different types of activities. We need to have our energies in different ways. Otherwise, most people have become competent in one way or the other, but if you ask them to do something totally different, they will find themselves totally at loss. This is simply because their energies get directed in one way only. An invocation means you kind of make yourself malleable in such a way that for every different type of action, you need your energies in different 
parts of your system and you are able to graduate that, calibrate that in such a way to perform that specific activity. So when I sit here, what we need to do is different from what I was doing when I was walking down here. So this is just calibration using sounds. If we have to know the meaning, it's uh, talking about how birth is sweetness, but death is compassion, it's a relief. We may think death is a terrible thing, but uh, aren't we glad that someday we will die? Suppose we could not die, that would be terrible, isn't it <laughs> Suppose we can't die at all. And uh, above all, it is talking about yoga in the sense, the chant is describing yoga as a way of transcending time. When we say transcending time, Right now, we have a sense of time only because we are so identified with our physical nature. Suppose we did not have a body, we would, uh, would not have any sense of time. Our body is keeping time. Everything that is time is cyclical, but yoga is a dimension which wants to transcend, which helps you to transcend these cycles and make a journey beyond cyclical nature of life, which is the nature of physical existence. Thank you. Um, I had a teacher at Harvard who was a medical doctor, and he told me a story that uh, when he was a young doctor, he went down to Mississippi, and he saw children there in the United States, this is in the uh, mid-1960s, who were starving. And um, after that trip, he went to Washington, D.C., and he, had, uh, he tried to meet a group of senators, and he went to one after the other, and none of them would talk to him. And on Sunday afternoon, he got my father's phone number at home. My father is Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And my sister, Kerry, who runs the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial, is here right now, and my wife, Vicki. So, but he got my dad's number, and he called, and, uh, and it was Sunday. My dad's with the children, and, and, and he said to him, uh, well, all right, why don't you come over and we'll talk. And um, after they spoke, my dad went to Mississippi, to where this uh, doctor had gone, and when he came back, he wrote this, uh, he, he said these words, um, and there are others. On the back roads of Mississippi where thousands of children slowly starve their lives away, their minds damaged beyond repair by the age of four or five, in the camps of the migrant workers, a half million nomads, virtually unprotected by collective bargaining or social security, minimum wage or workman's compensation, exposed to the caprice of fate and the cruelty of their fellow man alike, and on Indian reservations where the unemployment rate is 80 percent, and where suicide is not a philosopher's question, but the leading cause of death among young people. So after that trip, my uh, father went back to the Senate, and he worked with a group of others, and they, uh, they created the first food stamps program in the United States. And that is kind of the development model that I'm used to. So when I look at the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, my immediate reaction is to think, are the Addis Ababa Accords going to fund this or not? But you have a different approach. Can you talk about yoga in that context? So when we say sustainable development goals, we are talking about human well-being, addressing human well-being as seventeen different issues which concerns poverty, nourishment, health, women's issues, environment, these kind of things. Essentially, we're talking about human well-being. How can you transform the world without transforming individual human beings? This is the effort that's going on in the world for a long time. We want to transform the world, but we are not aiming at individual human beings. The world is just a word, it is just you and me. If there is no transformation in you and me, if there is no change in the way we perceive, experience and fe think, feel and act in this world, how can you change the world? So we can pump in money, we can have projects, they will all go up and go down. But only if we transform individual human beings on a large scale, only then there will be true transformation. This is why yoga becomes a significant thing. Today, the United Nations taking this… Uh, taking up this International Yoga Day is a very important step. I would say it's a revolutionary approach because without 
transforming individual human beings, you cannot really transform the world because there is no such thing as in reality. In reality, there's just you, me and someone else. If all of us change, the world has changed. If we refuse to change, we will be only talking about it. I have been to any number of international peace conferences and everybody is talking about world peace. In one of these conferences where there were seventeen uh, Nobel laureates, I asked them a simple question. Is it… is it true that all of you are truly peaceful human beings? Can you put your hand on your heart and say, I am peaceful? They admitted, no Sadhguru, we don't know how to be peaceful, but we want the world peaceful. How is that possible? What… what you see as the world is just a larger manifestation of who we are. Sadhguru, the um, you know, I, I, there were thousands of people doing… Uh, doing yoga in… Um, doing yoga in Times Square for International Yoga Day, and you can see all around the world, in Brazil, in the United States, in L.A. where I live, people are doing yoga. And when we're doing it, we're… I'm stretching out my body and <laughs> trying to control my breathing. Can… can you explain what yoga really is and how that can help <clears throat> attain the SDGs? So this fundamental human longing for health, for well-being, for fulfillment of life. When you find a logically correct and scientifically ascertainable way, then we say this is yoga. Yoga means in search, in pursuit of human well-being, we've been doing all kinds of things. We've been looking up for a long time, which has led to humanity being divided in the name of religions, castes, creeds in so many different ways. Now in the last fifty years, I would say we are looking out seriously and we are ripping the planet apart. All the environmental degradation that we are talking about is just in pursuit of human well-being. In the last hundred years, definitely we are the most comfortable generation ever. But we cannot say we are well because <laughs> we are not really well. People are not happy, people are not peaceful, that is not happening because we have not addressed the inner nature. So when it… when you address it in a scientific manner, rather than by belief, by philosophy, by ideologies, you address human well-being in a scientific way, this is yoga. And yoga is a way of… the word yoga literally means union. When we say union, what we're talking about is, we're talking about a scientific way of obliterating your… the boundaries of your individuality. When I say a scientific way of obliterating the boundaries of your individual nature, what this means is, right now as we sit here, this is me, that is you, distinctly clear, but we are breathing the same air, we are… we are a product of the same earth. What you call as myself is just a pop-up on this planet and it'll pop out. But in this little bit of time, we have divided this in such a way that we can't meet. Yoga means you obliterate these individual boundaries, not intellectually, not by belief, not by ideology, but as a living experience. We… we launched a… I mean, this was there on the video, we launched a very large-scale environmental project in southern India. The fundamental for this came from this. This happened to me when I was in the university and recently about eight years ago, when I… when I happened to be in my hometown and after a very long time, one of my English teachers came up to me and said, now I understand why you would not let me teach Robert Frost. I said, ma'am, why would I not let you teach Robert Frost? I like Robert Frost. She said, don't you remember you didn't let me teach Frost? Then I remembered. She came one day, till then we were reading only English poets, she came and introduced the American poet and she said, Robert Frost, such a great man, and then she started off, woods are lovely, dark and deep. I said, stop. I said, a man who calls a tree a wood, I don't want to listen to this guy. She <laughs> she said, no, no, this is a very great poet. I said, I don't care how great he is, he calls tree a wood. I don't want to listen to him. 
Then when we wanted to start this process in uh, southern India, when we found that rivers were going dry and the groundwater was sinking very rapidly, when I decided we will plant 114 million trees in Tamil Nadu, the simple thing that we did was, I took thousands of people, made them sit in the trees, and we set up a yogic process with which they experienced that what they are breathing out, the trees are inhaling. What the trees are exhaling, they are inhaling. And they realized one half of their lungs is hanging out there. Once they realize this, there is no stopping. Even today, millions of trees are being planted on a yearly basis, all done by common people, simply because we brought this yogic experience to them, that they truly realize that one half of their breathing apparatus is actually out there, not here. So, bringing this experience into people, that what you think as myself is not within the boundaries of your physical nature, it goes well beyond that. If this becomes a living reality, then fulfilling these goals that United Nations has for the world is… becomes much more possible than the way it is right now, where we are trying to push in one way, but a whole lot of people are pushing in the opposite direction because they don't even see it as theirs. Thank you, Sadhguru. I, I wanted to uh, point out this incredible thing about the tree planting project is that Sadhguru insisted that the trees be planted on small plots of land, less than half an acre, and half of the trees are fruit trees, and then half of them can be used for firewood, so that the people who live on these lands are benefited from them, they take care of the trees, and those trees actually really grow. And um, one of the things that that's really working on is, uh, is poverty. And when I look at the world today, and I see, especially in the United States, this incredible gap between people who have capital and people who don't. And uh, it's, a, it's a very disturbing sign to me, um, the, this, the gap between rich and poor. Can you talk a little bit about how yoga would address that in terms of sustainable development? So we must understand this, that we have chosen econo an economic model, which is all about everybody for himself or herself. There is no larger commitment to humanity as such, because that is market economy. Everybody does according to their own capabilities and skills and grab what they can grab. It's literally uh, shoot and scoot economy. But we have gone for this simply because the socialistic, communistic ideas have unfortunately failed, not necessarily because they're bad, because human beings are not ready for it yet. That is, poor people who had nothing wanted to share, the rich never wanted to share, so it became a joke in the world. If the rich had to… if rich had the consciousness to share, Communism would have been a great idea, but the poor want to share, rich don't want to share. So that is the same situation here, and this is the same situation building up everywhere else in the world. Is this the best way to run the world? No. But do we have a better idea? No. So <laughs> because right now we are in that place. So the only thing that we can truly do is that we bring what is this… what we are referring to as yoga, as a living experience. Yoga does not mean twisting your body, yoga does not mean standing on your head, yoga does not mean holding your breath. Yoga means in some way you have transcended the limitations of your physical nature. You are beginning to experience life as a larger possibility, not just this physical form that you are. Once this becomes a living experience, sharing and living together will become a, a common experience everywhere. Does it mean we are going to start communes and everybody will live together? No, we can run businesses in a more inclusive way. We can create a more inclusive economic model. And this need not be done by government policy. This can be done by private individuals because there are companies which are almost as large as nations today. There are companies which budgets… which are bigger than nations. So it is very much possible that business can be run in a more inclusive way. Right now we are thinking only of profit. Our idea of profit is very short-term kind of idea. 
If you really want to run your company, if you are thinking in terms of your company prospering in the next hundred, two hundred, five hundred years continuously, then it's very important that you make your customer your partner, that you make everybody else in the society your partner. Whatever you are manufacturing or whatever you are selling or whatever the business is, whether you are selling a safety pin or a computer or a spacecraft, essentially the business is about human well-being. If this is… this comes into the consciousness of every business person, if this comes into the consciousness of building every business, that essentially this is about human well-being. We do it in so many ways, but fundamentally it's about that. If this awareness and consciousness is instilled in the businesses on the planet, then you can find the capitalistic way of living need not mean disparity, can mean well-being to everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> Sadhguru, I, I read the other day that um, that for every dollar in government investment um, that, uh, in developing countries, that there's seven dollars now in private investment. So, how do we use yoga to yoke in the, uh, the private corporations that are looking just at their bottom line um, to, to uh, end up really having development that's fair and just? In the last twenty years, uh, I have largely focused on the business leaders because there was a time a few hundred years ago where the most influential leadership on the planet was religious leadership. Later on, when the military machines built up in a big way, the military leaders dominated the world. In the last hundred years, democratically elected leaders have become the most dominant force. In the next fifteen to twenty-five years, you will see the business leaders will be the most important or influential leadership on the planet. The good thing about business is that a businessman is willing to make a deal if the deal is good, <laughs> no matter who you are. I'm saying the old prejudice of I cannot make a deal with somebody is going away and they're willing to make a deal. Now, anything is sustainable only if it is beneficial to both the parties. Nothing can be sustained either in the marketplace or in marriage unless it's beneficial to both the parties. Only when it's truly beneficial to both the parties, this can be sustained. This is slowly sinking into the business leadership. I have seen in the last twenty years, prominent business leaders, their way of thinking is very, very different than what it was. My essential work has been to move individual leaders from their personal ambitions to a larger vision, because a larger vision means then the business is sustainable for a long period of time. If it's just your personal ambition, the world will work against you. If you have a larger vision, the world will work with you. This is a big difference. So this is something that is slowly sinking in. You will see if you see annual meetings of uh, major businesses, what they're talking, if you look at the economic forum, if you look at various economic, uh, you know, assemblies on the planet, you will see they're all beginning to talk about a larger vision, how to make a difference rather than how to make a profit. This has become the language of the business these days. It still has to manifest in a big way, but at least the language has changed from profit to making a difference. Thank you. Sadhguru, the… Um, <clears throat> when you look at societies all across the world, there, there is a huge gap between what's available to women and what's available to men. The Sustainable Development Goals address this. How… Uh, what's the role of gender equality in yoga? See, yoga means uh, transcending your physical nature on one level. If you transcend your physical nature, where is the question of being a male or a female? You being a male or a female is relevant only in a few spaces in your life, in bathrooms and bedrooms. Rest of the places, I don't see why you should recognize somebody as a man or a woman. Why are we identifying people with reproductory organs? If you must use a body part, at least use the brain.
I think a small gender difference that is there between us to fulfill a certain aspect of our life is being stretched too far. I think this is from another period where it was not possible for a woman to participate because of variety of physical situations in the world. And that is largely leveled today in most parts of the world and it's rapidly changing everywhere, I would say. Uh, I think a more active effort is needed, at least by law in most nations, it is hundred percent equal. By practice, there is still discrepancies which has to be worked at. I feel it's a generational thing. Once the older generation moves out, the younger generation is not looking at it that way anymore. At least I see that in all the Asian countries, it is only people beyond sixty years of age who think on… in this mode. The younger people are not thinking that way anymore. Thank you. So, Guru, I'm just going to ask you one more question because I, I want to save time for the audience um, who've been uh, waiting to talk to you. And um, I, can you talk, tell about how you conceive the world in thirty years? What I see is uh, for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, human intellect is sparking like never before. More people on the planet today can think for themselves than ever before in the history of this human existence. So once human intellect begins to spark like this, unless something is logically correct and scientifically verifiable, it will fail in future. You may be willing to listen to a few things, but your children are not going to listen to anything that does not make sense to them. It does not matter from what authority it comes from. Or in other words, we are moving into an era where authority cannot be the truth. Truth will be the only authority in future. We are getting there because everybody is beginning to ask questions and people are not afraid to ask questions anymore, so this is bound to happen. Once this happens, human aspiration for well-being has to have a logically correct and scientifically ascertainable methodology and it's of tremendous importance that today the International Yoga Day has been declared in the last uh, one year. It was mooted by the Prime Minister but it was almost like the world was waiting for it as they mentioned, 177 countries, never before in the history of United Nations, all of them agreed upon one thing as they agreed upon yoga. It looked like they were waiting for it. Yes, the world has been waiting for a scientific and a logically correct solution for human well-being. The aspiration for human well-being will not stop. Unless we provide a proper scientifically structured methodology, then people in terms of well-being will move towards chemicals. This is a deep, a grave concern in the world. The number of people moving towards alcohol and drugs in the last twenty-five years must be maybe five hundred to thousand percent more than what it was twenty-five years ago. This is mainly because in pursuit of human well-being, there are no logically correct answers to their questions. That is the reason why human beings are seeking these kind of solutions. Unless we provide this, this is a natural progression. I see in the next thirty years to fifty years, there will be a big movement towards a scientific process for inner well-being. And this is the right time to be here at this uh, forum and this yoga becoming a worldwide thing. We must understand yoga is not an Indian thing. If you want to call yoga Indian, then you must call gravity European, okay? <laughs> because yes, it… Uh, it originated from that place because India is one place where for a few millennia we had uninterrupted time to look deep inwards and to look at the human mechanism in utmost profoundness as to how this functions, what is the ultimate possibility within this human mechanism. This has taken a few millennia to understand and arrive at this possibility and yoga 
I want this message to go, the science of yoga is not just about health, it's not just about fitness, it is an ultimate solution for every aspect of human existence. There is different types of yogas, yoga can be taught in different di dimensions, the ultimate possibility of raising beyond our physical nature, the ultimate possibility of knowing life in its fullest way. The word yoga means union, the word yogi means one who has experienced this union. We need not one, two, five yogis, we need millions of them who have a sense of union with the rest of the universe, particularly those who hold responsible positions in the world. They must come to this experience because leadership essentially means you have the privilege of touching other people's lives. What you think, what you feel and what you do, every single thought, emotion and action either makes or breaks people's lives, that's what leadership means. When you are given such a privilege, it's very, very important that you are in a state of yoga, that you experience life around you as yourself. If we… if any of us feel the work that we are doing is important, the first and foremost thing is we must work upon ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadhguruji, for those words of wisdom. And thank you, Max, for joining us here. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you for organizing the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Max. We will switch gears now. Sadhguruji, we'll request you to keep seating. Uh, we'll request uh, Ms. Tao Porshan Lynch to again join uh, Sadhguruji on the dais. Uh, we'll open the floor for some comments and questions by our dignitaries. And uh, to start with, uh, it gives me deep uh, honor and pleasure to first give the floor to uh, Under Secretary General Ambassador Vijay Nambiar, who uh, will also be delivering a message on behalf of the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki moon. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> I shall just be delivering the message of the uh, Secretary General uh, on tomorrow's International Day of Yoga. Uh, much, of, much has been said already, and I'd, I think I'd rather listen than. Uh, uh, then offer my own comments. Uh, this is the message of the Secretary General. Yoga is an ancient physical, mental, and spiritual practice that originated in India and is now practiced in various forms around the world. The word yoga derives from Sanskrit and means to join to or to unite, symbolizing the union of body and consciousness. Yoga balances body and soul, physical health, and mental well-being. It promotes harmony among people and between ourselves and the natural world. Recognizing its universal appeal, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 21st June as the International Day of Yoga. This year's observance of the International Day of Yoga highlights the important role healthy living plays in the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals adopted last year by all 193 United Nations member states. As exercise, yoga has multiple benefits. Physical inactivity is linked with a number of non-communicable diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, which are among the leading causes of illness and death worldwide. By improving fitness, teaching us how to breathe correctly, and working to diminish stress, yoga can help to cultivate healthier lifestyles. Practicing yoga can also help raise awareness of our role as consumers of the planet's resources and as individuals with a duty to respect and live in peace with our neighbors. All these elements are essential to building a sustainable future of dignity and opportunity for all. On the International Day of Yoga tomorrow, I urge everyone to embrace healthier choices and lifestyles and to commit to unity with our fellow human beings, regardless of ethnicity, faith, age, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Let us celebrate this day and every day as members of one human family, sharing one common, precious home. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, and thank you for that very thoughtful message from the Secretary General. May I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Bangladesh, sir. 
Thank you, uh, Amit. Uh, Guruji, uh, Madam Lynch, Mr. Kennedy, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, I express my gratitude to the Indian Mission for organizing this important event and giving me the opportunity to speak. We deeply appreciate the Indian government's initiative to have the International Day of Yoga. We have learned a lot from the yoga masters, especially the perspective as to how yoga can contribute in the attainment of global peace, sustainable future, and in turn the realization of the SDGs. What I understand, without peace of mind and harmony in the body, how can we think uh, we can change the world? First, we have to change our own world, by which what I mean is how we live, breathe, eat, think, and aspire. If we are not fit for the purpose of contributing to sustainable peace in the world, we will remain as bystanders and not as active agents of change. I can share my own personal story with my colleagues and others present here. I had been suffering from a very bad bout of sciatica problem for the last two months. At times, the pain was debilitating. I have gone through serious pain medication, followed by physical therapy and acupuncture. In fact, I am just coming here from my sixth session of acupuncture treatment. I realized that I suffered this problem because of accumulated lifestyle-related problems, which included long hours of sitting, standing, stress from the work, and also from the family for the constant change of places of postings, etc. During the last eight weeks of my ordeal, I reflected on my life and future course of action. I read a lot and searched the internet for answers, and I finally came to the conclusion that yoga is the answer to my situation. <laughs> Although I did some yoga in my college days, my biggest mistake was I, that I discontinued that. Perhaps if I continued, I would have never faced my present predicament. Now, the Bhujangasana or Cobra position, which is also known as McKenzie something, is critical for the health of my spine. There are many other asans or positions which can help me get my strength back as I feel a little better and able to practice those. The asans will not only help gain my physical strength, but it will contribute to my mental strength through the meditational aspects of yoga. I thought I'll share my most recent experience so that others like me in similar lifestyle situations can also learn and prevent the situation that I am in. Let's do yoga every day and not just one day in the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you very much for relating yoga to your personal experiences. May I now offer the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Georgia, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sadhguruji, uh, thank you very much. Madam Tao, thank you. We are blessed with uh, your presence here, and thank you, my dear friend Syed, for uh, organizing this wonderful uh, event. Uh, I was thinking about asking questions, but in fact, um, it's not as much as asking questions, but how what you told us echoes in, in all of us. And it really does, it really does, because what we, what we take from here, uh, from all this wonderful conversation that, uh, that we just had, is how complex things are indeed very simple, if we indeed try to. Um, as a person who is really honored and humbled to be here, uh, as a representative of my country, who was one of the 177 who co-sponsored uh, Yoga International Day, I'm an also a uh, practitioner, or rather a very bad student to the school that I'm attending. Uh, that school is called Yoga in Daily Life, which is in the United States, in many parts of Eastern Europe particularly, but uh, headquartered in Rajasthan, in Katu. Um, led by Vishwaguru Sri Swami Maheshwaranandaji. Uh, and what I learned from my personal experience, because after all, the oneness is sharing these personal experiences also, is what 
Patanjali said that it's about uh, having your mind free of disturbances. And if we had indeed attain to be free of disturbances, uh, we find peace with our mind, that can really transcend and uh, somehow start this chain reaction of peacefulness and oneness uh, that we all long for, particularly in, in this uh, organization. Uh, I'm glad that we have so many colleagues by now or calling from Bangladesh. My good friend who sits next to me is also uh, avid yoga uh, practitioner and many. And it is indeed uh, probably high time what you just mentioned when uh, Prime Minister of India said that we needed International Day of Yoga. It came indeed on a right, right time. And I'm glad that I was here on the right moment and right time. Thank you uh, for your presence here. Thank you for your blessing. And indeed, if we try to, I think we can really attain that we are without disturbance and we find this oneness and unity and we tick those 17 goals one by one. And I really hope to, and I'm looking forward to that day when we will no longer have this beautiful poster behind you because we will have that completed because SDGs in a way to me is somehow a manifestation of our common failure too that we have to talk about SDGs but it's good that we are starting to talk about it and we are making it happen hopefully and I believe in that yoga will create that oneness that will permeate our work in this organization in this chamber and otherwise thank you very much Om Shanti Thank you, Excellency. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, may I now offer the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Liechtenstein. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Sayed, for, for putting this together. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you called me and, said, and asked me if I was interested in saying a few words, I said, yes, of course. I didn't know what I was going to say, and in some ways I still don't. Uh, but he asked me to, uh, to share my personal experience. I was... Uh, um, I came from the probably most non-spiritual angle possible to yoga. I was essentially dragged against my will 17 years ago by a then girlfriend into yoga class. And, you know, I viewed myself as this uh, big soccer player and cyclist and all these other things and thought, really, this is not for me. And um, to my credit, I had to say already after the class, well, there is something there. And that is something that is worth exploring. And I've been doing yoga ever since. And if there's one thing that I believe I will be doing until the end of my life, it is yoga. Because every, everyone can do it. Uh, every person of every age, of every uh, state of health, really, yoga is for everyone, which is, I think, one of its wonderful qualities. Um, the other thing is, even if you come from that non-spiritual place that I came from, you realize over time that something happens with you and that there is, in a, there is for me today, no other way uh, of connecting with myself, with my mind, with my body, the way I can in yoga. Uh, sometimes I find out in, when I do yoga that I, before I did it, I didn't know how I was that day. And the moment I do it, I, I, I do I feel how I am and I'm able to connect to myself and that's also, I think, really the precondition for being able to connect, uh, to connect uh, with others. Um, I, you know, in, in looking at the theme and in thinking about this, for, for me the connection is, is, is very simple. Uh, the SDG agenda, you know, tells us we know what the problems are, we know what the solutions are, we have to simply change our ways to get there and then we can do this together. And I think this is where yoga can make a, a huge contribution. Um, if you think it's not for you, try it one time. And I think it will be for many of you. Actually, I think it's, it is for everybody. And one of my you know, small moments of happiness in life today is to take a person to yoga because that just makes you happy. 
Um, and this is why I'm offering a class tomorrow morning to some of you, to some of you uh, in the room, and you're gonna come say it with many others, and I lo really look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, uh, Sadhguruji, Tao, so far we have not had specific questions, but I'm sure when we revert back to you, you will be able to perhaps pick up on those comments and, and give us your thoughts. Uh, for now, I have the honor to uh, recognize uh, another yoga master we have with us. Uh, in fact, uh, Yogamata Kaiko Aikawa uh, has joined us for this event all the way from Japan. Uh, yoga Mata Kaiko Aikawa is a renowned yoga guru, and uh, she is reputed as the first non-Indian woman to be recognized to have reached the highest state of meditative consciousness. She is the creator of Aikawa Yoga, and she is also involved with charitable and humanitarian work. Yoga Mata, may I request you to say a few words, and we have your interpreter who will help us with English. Thank you. の遠い昔から。Sorry, I mistake he translate to English. Sorry. Uh, dear distinguished guests, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the government and mission of India for establishing the International Day of Yoga and for allowing me, a woman from Japan, to be invited as a special guest to the celebration, events, and to participate on this occasion. Spiritually, I come from a tradition and lineage that from the time immemorial have kept and shared with humanity the teachings of yoga. え、瞑想と、え、Yoga is a science that, especially with med meditation, facilitates the harmony of the body, the emotions, and the mind. When these elements are in harmony, the individual becomes calm and peaceful in his heart. If the individual is calm and peaceful in his heart, this permeates in the community and thus in the world. Uh, I え、だいたい今70歳ですけれども、え、この方法を始め、え、自分で学び、自分に、え、自分のため I started this process, this personal process, in my early 20s. I am now 71. So for more than 50 years, I have experienced these benefits first at first hand. Later, I was fortunate to be able to access the source of this knowledge in the Himalayas, where, where much of this knowledge is kept. I underwent more than seven years of teachings during this process. And after being trained in the arts of meditation and reaching enlightenment, my teachers... And, uh, 
、まあ、あのインドで、えー、20年間、えー、平和と愛をシェアするために深い、えー、瞑想、えー、それはあのインドではサマディというんですけれども、えー、そうした、えー、究極のサマディを、えー、人,も人々の前で、えー、デモンストレーションして平和の、えー、祈りを捧げました。For more than 20 years, I studied in India. I eventually reached enlightenment, enlightenment being Samadhi. I have performed Samadhi in front of many people in India, and through doing so, have been part of the process of assisting people with enlightenment and with reaching harmony. <laughs> えー、日本と世界に伝えるようにというミッションを、えー、受けました。And it is my teachers in the my teachers of meditation who gave me the mission of sharing this with the Japan with Japan and with the world as a whole、えー。ですから、えー、今日招かれまして私はここにいます。えー、私の個人の経験から言いますと。この方法を学べるとすべての人が自分のエネルギーの根源を目覚めさせ平和と愛とハーモニーを手にすることが可能です個人個人が心の中で平和とハーモニーを感じると世界中が Love and Peace spread out 愛と平和が広がりえー、そうしたこと、私は確信を持っています。And this is the reason that I am here today. I can attest from my own experience that by learning these practices, it is possible for everyone to awaken your own energies and achieve peace, love, and harmony. I, deep... ありがとうございました。I deeply believe that if, that if we as individuals feel peace and harmony in ourselves, That this will lead to love and peace being spread throughout the world. I thank you very much for enabling me to be present today. Thank you. Thank you, Yogamata, for that message of love.、Uh, may I now offer the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Nepal? Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Amit.、Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, the permanent mission of、uh, India, for organizing this wonderful event.、Uh, Nepal was, of course, on board when the resolution was proposed. And I even said、uh, last year that the United Nations was ready for yoga some time ago, but the initiative was lacking. And thank you for filling in that gap. Uh, we are so blessed with the distinguished presence of Sadhguru and、um, Tao and, and Yoga Mata.、Uh, we have benefited from the wisdom of、uh, talk and also the distinguished、uh, presence of the candidates.、Uh, thank you for your um, uh, questions and, and uh, uh, initiatives, which、uh, made us、uh, benefit e d a lot.、Uh, I don't have a prepared statement, but I, I do have a question, which I also posed last year when we. Uh, actually, celebrated the fir-、uh, first year, International Yoga Day. That is about、uh, the accessibility to yoga.、Uh, the virtues of yoga are beyond doubt. I come from Nepal, from the eastern hills of Nepal,、uh, a place, in, an environment which is extremely conducive for yoga, and I also come from a family and community practicing yoga. But then I'm always worried about、uh, this question of accessibility. It has to do with the commercialization of yoga today. The commercialization and, and hundreds and thousands、uh, of the different types of yoga、uh, getting into the heads of young minds and, and different ages of people,、uh, mostly also in terms、uh, of fashion, in the forms of fashion,、uh, what would be? Your wise guidance to us to deal with the perhaps unnecessary or over commercialization of yoga today 
so as to make it uh, the most of it to contribute to the sustainability or sustainable goals that we have adopted uh, the 70th year session of the United Nations last year. And it is uh, a question to, to you, distinguished sirs, and, and everybody. Thank you. Sadhguruji, would you like to take that question right away? Whatever becomes uh, reasonably popular, there will be enterprise around that. You shouldn't be surprised when you step out on the Times Square, people will be selling yoga t-shirts and yoga whatever, whatever, okay <laughs> We shouldn't be distracted or disturbed by these things. This is a part of a social thing, it happens. At the same time, the core of yoga is not disturbed in any way. On the surface, there are small distortions here and there. I would say for the larger public to start with, like this year when, you know, about four months ago, when I came to know that over 9,000 children below 18 years of age committed suicide in India and over 1,700 below 13 years of age committed suicide, it… Uh, I just thought, uh, if our children start committing suicide, we are doing something fundamentally wrong. A child is a fresh life, a child is an exuberant life. A, sh a child should be a bundle of joy, but instead of that, they are deciding to take their own life, which is deeply disturbing. This is not a statement about the child who took his life, but this is a statement about all of us, what are we doing with our societies. So, off the cuff I said, let's touch 10,000 schools, but today with the cooperation of various state governments, we are touching nearly 30,000 schools, over 20 million children. Why I'm saying this, why this has become possible is because we are offering what is called as Upa Yoga. Upa Yoga means pre-yoga or sub-yoga. Why this effort towards Upa Yoga is, if you offer yoga, however innocuous the practice may look to start with, it has a spiritual dimension to it. Transmitting spiritual dimension to an unconscious population who are not ready for it and without a certain level of expertise in the teachers could be responsible over a period of time. So we are teaching Upa Yoga which has mainly physiological and psychological benefits and here you can't do anything wrong, it's on the video, all the teacher has to do is make corrections and make sure people are not doing it wrong. I think it's a good way to spread yoga in the world is through Upa Yoga. Upa Yoga, the word Upa Yoga in Indian languages today has acquired the meaning of being useful, but actually it originates from this that it's a pre-yoga or sub-yoga or a start-up start -up yoga it is. And it's best to start that way with large populations because when you start off an unconscious spiritual process for people, many of them may not be ready for it, even if it's a good thing. Even if good thing happens to you when you're not ready for it, things may <laughs> not work very well. So, Upa Yoga is a, a very distinct way and a safe way to take yoga to the world large scale. After this happens, once they feel the benefits, once they experience what difference it makes, they will naturally seek yoga in a more a uh, serious manner and that is when yoga should come into their lives. This could solve the concern that you expressed. But at the same time, somebody is doing something funny in the name of yoga, it doesn't concern me because those things will always happen. But it's good that even commercial establishments are talking yoga. This means it's really on. Thank you, Sadhguruji. Uh, what we will do is we will go on and collect a few more comments uh, and then come back to you, both of you. Uh, I will now call upon uh, Mr. Herman Bravo, who is the president of the Yoga Club right here at the UN. Mr. Bravo, you have the floor. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Indian mission 
for organizing this wonderful gathering. The yoga club has 600 members and yoga is nothing new at the UN. Some of you remember that the second secretary general, Dag Hammarskjöld, created a meditation room just around the corner at the visitor's entrance. And we had many yoga activities in the 60s. Right now we have a large number of members. We have only four classes per week. And we are very, very convinced that yoga is more than an instrument of personal transformation. Yoga has, as many of the speakers have mentioned, particularly Sadhguru, a social dimension. All that because the word yoga, as Tao remember us, yoga means union. Union between the body and the mind. Union between us and other human beings. Union between human beings and nature. And it is because of that interdependence and that interconnection that we are able to solve many of the problems. Fortunately, at this moment of history, the United Nations and many scientists have been able to identify that we are very close to a terrible catastrophe that some of them call the sixth extinction. Our level of <clears throat> contamination in the oceans, climate change, <clears throat> overpopulation, rampant poverty, depletion of our resources, loss of biodiversity, all of them are symptoms of this major catastrophe. But what is interesting, as Sadhguru told us, we have many problems, but we have to be optimistic because the solution is by changing ourselves. Many of these strategies organized by the UN, they have a political meaning. They have a the access to technologies and they have the will at the political level. But all that is not going to work unless we go at the individual level. Yoga means personal transformation. And because of that, the International Day of Yoga should be a wonderful opportunity to remind all of us that every day in our life should be a yoga day. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bravo, for that message and for your efforts in promoting yoga in the United Nations. Uh, I now give the floor to Ms. Neta Menabde, who is the Executive Director of the Office of the World Health Organization here at the United Nations. Uh, Ms. Menabde, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ambassador Apkar Rudin, um, Yoga Master Madam Tao and Sadhguru, it's a great pleasure and an honor to attend this celebration today. And indeed, this is a very unusual event for the United Nations because it is deeply reflective and it's not composed of a pre uh, prepared speeches that people deliver in a more formal way. It actually moves all of us here to think deeply of what is being said, what is being done, what is being conveyed by you here, and how we can individually and collectively respond to this call of the International Yoga Day. I have spent five years of my life in India before coming here in New York. And of course, for me, it's something very special to be here today at this day. And it's special because I, you mentioned, uh, Sadhguru, that we cannot call or uh, compare and say that uh, yoga is Indian, but it comes from India. And indeed, it is India's gift to the humankind to all over the world. And it is very special because of that. And I could see the impact of yoga practice on communities in India. So it makes a different difference. And this is why this is such a great gift of civilization. The whole country in India, every quarter of it, breathes essence of yoga. And it is the civilization calm of yoga that has moved me when I was there. In my work, we are dealing with health issues. It is no news now that yoga is very good for health. 
but we also know now that uh, health is no longer a standalone one of the sustainable development goals. It is actually determinant for any other goal to, to be achieved. Therefore, yoga has a very different meaning and different, indeed, interconnecting nature because it does help people to feel better, live better, breathe better, act better, unite better, come into interconnectedness, which is indeed essential for sustaining our planet and connects planet to the people. So therefore, of course, we know today, proven through many clinical trials, that yoga helps in many conditions, mental health conditions, um, depression, heart conditions, many other conditions, joint and, and, and so on. So this is not new, but there has been traditional resistance to integrate yoga practice and other perhaps traditional medicine practices which are uh, of course available worldwide but known also in India, uh, to integrate them to the allopathic uh, medicine. And this resistance is slowly being overcome. We as WHO are trying to put our, uh, our support into this process uh, recently, this year in May, in fact, India has signed an, I would say, landmark agreement with the World Health Organization to promote traditional medicine, yoga included, and to ensure quality and safety of these traditional practices, but more so to integrate these practices into our health services, primary health care, and all other services that we know. So it is now deeply understood that as all of human beings need some or another kind of health services, be it vaccination if, if they are very healthy or any other more serious uh, services, they also need to practice yoga because it prevents many illnesses. It also gives peace of mind. It teaches us how to cope with all those different things that modern life uh, stress puts on human uh, brain. And therefore, we st stand forward and we want to support promotion and inclusion of yoga into um, medical practice all over the world. We will collaborate with India on that. But my question to, to you would be, is there any good secret beyond of what you have said? How we can bring this different dimensions of health together, integrate them in a better way, and make sure that yoga is no longer seen as something separate from, uh, from what we do in health services traditionally. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. When... Uh... Our commitment has to shift to health, not to a particular system. People are married to a particular system most of the time and they defend that system at any cost, no matter what. Every system in the world has something to contribute. But instead of being committed to health, we are committed to those systems. Because of this, there has been a lot of dislocation in how health can come about. So in southern India, in the rural part of uh, Tamil Nadu, we brought this about these five dimensions, allopathy, Siddha, Ayurveda, Yunani and yoga together practice along with the naturopathy way of doing things. It has done miraculous things to the populations. We were the first pilot project by the Ayush uh, project when it started ten years ago. Now Ayush has become a ministry. I think yesterday or in the last week they have declared a Ayush University, which means Ayurveda, Yoga, Siddha and all these things put together. This we started almost fifteen years ago and today it is an active part. What we have done is we have medical vans which go with a, an allopathic doctor and a Siddha doctor, plus we have created over uh, one hundred and twelve or thirteen uh, village gardens where we grow herbs, over hundred, hundred and odd different types of herbs 
in a common piece of land where people are taught how to make use of it. For small things like stomach ache, headache, fever for the children, diarrhea, these kind of things, all our grandmothers knew how to treat this. Unfortunately, even for these people are going to the doctors today and the way it is being treated with elaborate medication, generally in rural India, the cost of the medicine, if you fall sick for fifteen days, it takes a year for you to recover with the economics of the family, gets hit for almost a year. If fifteen days somebody is down and they visit the doctor and the volume of medication and treatment that happens, kind of economically sets them back quite a bit. So we… our commitment is to health, not to a particular system. And right now the government of India is doing serious efforts to integrate this thing and we've been doing this for over fifteen years very effectively. I must tell you, a simple thing in rural India which can be… I was just last one week I was in Africa, even there I thought this is something that will work. We created what is called as a wave of health about simple things, how health can be created with… within the family, for every family. One of the things that was done, I won't go into all the details, one simple thing with it was, every home should have a papaya tree, a banana tree, a murungu tree and a patch of greens. This transformed health situations in such a big way, you won't believe such a small initiative, such a simple initiative, what a difference it has done to people's lives. Like this small initiative can be brought because considering the economics of those families, it's very important we need to come up with solutions that work for them. In this yoga practice has a significant role because creating a vibrant, uh, healthy, vibrant and effervescent, effervescent population is very, very important to fulfill the sustainable goals. If we don't create that kind of population, we will be only talking about sustainability, uh, it will not happen. We need to create this and the goal is the tools of self-transformation should not be in the hands of a guru or an organization or some other authority. The idea is to bring this into everybody's life. Like today everybody owns a toothbrush which has created oral health. Just like that everybody should have some tools for self-transformation. It is with this kind of… Uh, commitment that we are going ahead and uh, there is a big support now in the world, wherever we go, in the remotest parts of Africa that I was there in the last one week. It was incredible to see that all of them know about yoga. I know this twenty-five years ago when I went into rural India in a big way, uh, they knew what is Coca-Cola but they did not know what is yoga. But today in the remotest part of Africa, people know what is yoga. This is transformation in many ways. Thank you, Sadhguruji, and uh, thank you, Ms. Minabde, for that, for that question and that perspective. Uh, and thank you also, Tao, for your patience. We'll revert to you in a short while. Uh, we will take two more uh, speakers for very short comments, uh, and then we will have uh, a question in the social media. I now give the floor to uh, Mr. Rajiv Lalla, who has joined us all the way from Texas. Uh, Mr. Lalla was earlier the CEO at NDTV News Limited and is currently uh, runs consulting teams at IBM's Global Business Services. Mr. Lalla is a lifelong yoga practitioner and has taught yoga for several years all over the United States. Mr. Lalla, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, um, uh, ambassadors, distinguished uh, dignitaries, Sadhguru, Madam Lynch, um, fellow yogis, thank you for setting this all up, and uh, of course, Ms. Narang, uh, Sayed Sahib, setting, uh, thank you for setting this up, thank you for having us together and raising our awareness towards yoga and oneness. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I'll just make a couple of quick comments and have a question uh, instead of uh, extending this. I know we are running out of time, so. Um, I spend a lot of time these days at IBM looking at many of these uh, uh, sustainable development growth objectives because IBM happens to be a, a company at that scale where it can make an impact. So many of my colleagues are devoted to such causes. Um, having some background in yoga and then teaching yoga for a few decades and learning from the masters uh, brings about that awareness where 
I've come to realize that um, the tools that STEM offers, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, language, logic, um, has its own limitations. So despite all the noble goals that we engineers take on, we realize that uh, to a certain point, we can take humanity and we can take these sustainable goals forward. But after a while, there comes a place where a leap of faith is required. Uh, something that lies beyond logic and reason. And personally, I've discovered that through my practice of uh, yoga and meditation. Um, the question I had uh, for, for uh, Madam Lynch and, and for Sadhguru is, um, if you could help us understand the role of a guru, of a teacher, not in the true academic sense where a STEM professor teaches me science and technology, but rather um, coming from humanity and that, uni that, that uh, union among all of us. That connection definitely lies beyond language. We are limited because of the, the, the limitations of language and culture. How then a guru help us transcend that gap and really find that unity? Uh, that makes it worthwhile to achieve these sustainable goals. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> when you say a Sadhguru, uh, you're saying an uneducated guru. That's what it means. Because you don't come to a Sadhguru to know about the scriptures, you don't come to Sadhguru to know about rituals, because the only thing that I know is, I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate and this is all I know. By knowing this, by inference, you know just about everything because everything is made the same way. Today there is something called as a constructional theory where they're talking about how the atom and the cosmos are essentially fundamentally same design, only the sophistication and complexity is multiplying. So the amoeba and you and me are made the same way, only the complexity has multiplied. Having said that, in what way is a, a guru relevant means, you're trying to walk on uncharted terrain. Every year I trek in the Himalayas, in Nepal and Tibet, once you go into the mountains, that illiterate Sherpa who is there, who has not been to school. But if he says right, you turn right, if he says left, you turn left. You better do that, otherwise you won't come back <laughs> You do that because he knows the terrain. The same goes for this. This is just an inner terrain. It's best to walk with somebody who's already walked the path. Otherwise, simple things will become complicated. What is next door, you will go around the world and come back to it. All this complication about, for example, today if you utter the word meditation, people think something very difficult to do. To put it simply, first of all, the word meditation, English word meditation does not describe anything in particular. If you sit with your eyes closed, they're saying you're meditating. With your eyes closed, you can do japa, tapa, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, shunya, there are any number of things you could do. Or you might have just mastered the art of sleeping in vertical postures <laughs> It happens <laughs> So, when we say meditation, we must understand it's not an act, it is a quality. It is like you want flowers in your garden. If you want flowers in your garden, you don't have to sit there and do flower meditation. You don't have to think flowers, you have to think soil, manure, water, sunlight. Have nothing to do with flowers, but if you do those things, flowers will happen because it's a consequence. Right now, because we have gotten into this madness of being a goal-oriented society, we are interested in the flower, we are not interested in the plant. This is the fundamental that the yoga will change within you. You understand that you have to handle the process right for a consequence to happen. So in yoga there is a saying that if you're goal-oriented, your one eye will be on the goal. That means you will find your way only with one eye, which is an inefficient way of doing things. 
If you use both your eyes to find your way, it's much more efficient. So, why is a guru needed? It can be done without it. I, I'm asking you a simple question. Even to learn A, B, C, the alphabet, you needed a teacher. But you could have learnt it by yourself, maybe you would have taken a lifetime, but the teacher taught it to you in a month or two, that's a big difference. So, like somebody was talking to me and uh, they asked, what is this guru about? I said, this is the GPS, a living GPS, <laughs> a guru positioning system, you know <laughs> If you want to find your way, it's best in uncharted terrain, unknown terrain, it's best to walk with somebody who's already done the terrain once or many times. Otherwise, simple things will get become very complex. Chao, would you like to reflect on this question, the importance of a guru, of a teacher? I want to thank you all. There's been so much beauty in this room. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all. You, there's been so much beauty in this room and so much intelligence that of what the world is all about and what we are all about and what we're going to do about it. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic to sit here and listen to all of the things that I've pondered for so many years and wondered about, not always finding the answers. But today was a revelation and a very special thing to happen to the whole world. In this room, you've started something that we've needed for a long time. It's out in the open now. Yoga is beautiful, but yoga is only beautiful if we use it and we make it part of our lives. I want to thank you all, because it's you who's made it part of mine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tao. Uh, we will take, uh, we'll go out on to our last speaker. And it's my pleasure to recognize Ms. Denise Cotto, who is the chair of the International Yoga Day Committee at the United Nations and an executive board member of the United Nations Staff Recreation Council Enlightenment Society. Denise, you have the floor. I'd like to echo the gratitude that we have to the India Mission, to everyone who contributed to bringing us together and creating this wonderful uh, ability for us to have a conversation and dialogue it's been very rich, and I appreciate the insight and wisdom. The International Day of Yoga Committee at the UN came into existence last year in the summer after the first International Day of Yoga. We had organized an event at the UNFPA that dealt with the beneficial impact of yoga upon the integral being, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and spiritual being, and how that impacted with evidence and studies and talked about the real um, evidence that, that there is to show, the science that there is to show that yoga is so beneficial. Uh, we're made up of many different kinds of NGOs here. I'm a lawyer. We have legal groups. We have medical doctors, medical groups. We have faith-based groups, including groups from India who are Hindu-based, but others beyond that. So uh, we're a diverse group. and. Um, we would like to understand your vision of how the underlying principles of yoga can be applied here in the greater uh, UN system. Sri Chinmoy years ago, his vision was to have peace meditations with the staff, and he started the yoga club, which German is the president of. So I wanted to ask a question originally about partnerships, which you already answered. Then I thought, well, what about gender equality? Because I've worked on so many of these issues for years. And then I thought, well, what about a more peaceful world? But we've had such a rich, dis rich discussion, so now my question is to you, Tao, and to you, Sadhguru, how do you see the UN system, meaning the secretarial staff who work here, the diplomats from the different countries, business and the NGOs, civil society, who 
try to implement the SDGs, how do you see yoga bringing us all together? Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Terry, would you like to comment on behalf of Tao? In any case, just if you represent no, uh, yoga, you ha it has to be something that can be shown to everyone. It's not something that's just words. It's not gymnastics that go like this, you know, and everybody is happy, but that's not it. It's deep within us, and only by what we do uh, is it worthwhile. I try to make it absolutely my life because it's beautiful. It makes me wake up in the morning knowing that there's something special waiting for me, all my students. And this morning I had a, a large class of students from all over the world. And they're going out and they're going to try and be what I believe yoga is all about. To go, we must practice what we preach and what we believe in. I, when I see all of you, I feel so small because of all that you have done and what you're doing. And as much as I can do anything to help you, even the tiniest thing, I, I will be very honored if you'd let me be part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is being said again and again about peace. So we need to look at this. When we say peace or mental peace as people are talking about it, today even so-called spiritual leaders are talking about peace being the highest goal in one's life. But I would like to ask you, please look at your life and see. If you want to enjoy your dinner tonight, even if you're not ecstatic, at least you must be peaceful to enjoy your dinner. If you want to enjoy the people around you, at least you must be peaceful and happy. If you want to enjoy your walk on the street, you must be peaceful and happy, otherwise it's not possible. So what is very fundamental to… a fundamental requirement in our life, unfortunately we are pushing it as an ultimate goal of our life. To be peaceful is not the highest thing. It is the most basic requirement. If a human being cannot even be peaceful, there is really nothing that they can do. This means that you're not even able to harness your body and mind the way you should. To look at it from one perspective, all human experience has a chemical basis to it. What you call as peace is a certain kind of chemistry, what you call as joy is another kind of chemistry, blissfulness another, ecstasy another, agony another kind anxiety, fear, te stress, tension, whatever you call it, every human experience has a chemical basis to it. Now the question is only, are you a great soup or a lousy soup? This is a chemical soup. Now, are you a great soup or a lousy soup? That's all the question is. If I give the same soup-making ingredients to all these people, do you believe they will turn out a same kind of soup? They will turn out hundred different varieties of soups not because the ingredients are different, all of us are made with the same stuff, just see how different we have become. This is simply because we have not been taught about how to deal with this. When I say how to deal with this, as a… as a technology, if you want to look at this as a machine, this is the most sophisticated piece of technology on the planet. The question is, to deal with this high level of technology, have you 
read even the user's manual, that's a question. Yoga means it is the user's manual of how to conduct this one. I would say when you ask this question, how to bring all these diverse people together in this organization, it's best to start with the simplest process, which does not even need a specific allotment of time. This is where Upa Yoga will become useful. People can sit in their work spaces and right there they can do it three minutes, any time they feel like it. It does not need a specific condition, it does not need a specific time. If they see the benefit, which they definitely will, in a matter of two weeks time they will see a distinct benefit doing it wherever they are. It does not need any kind of specific discipline or time or other conditions required for normal… Um, the proper yoga to be done. I think this would be a good way to integrate them because this predates all religion. This is not about you versus me. This is why I said this is not Indian because a science cannot be Indian. Yes, it originated from India. As Indians, we are proud of it, but it does not belong to India. The very fact that United Nations has declared an International Yoga Day means India has gifted it to the world. It does not belong to India anymore. We <laughs> it's, it's not something that we have to possess and identify with. W the significant aspect of my personal work has been to remove all the frills of culture that yoga had acquired through this millennia of transmission. Slowly, whatever you do in a particular culture, it will acquire cultural frills. So one thing is to take off all the cultural frills and present it as an absolute science and a technology for well-being. This is an important thing in an organization like this, where there are people from every nation, there are people from every kind of denominations, every kind of faith, every kind of beliefs, every kind of ideologies. It's very, very important that yoga is brought as a proper science, not as a cultural thing, not as an Indian thing. It's very important to do that. Thank you to, to both the yoga masters and this is really such a fascinating discussion that we could perhaps go on for several more hours, but unfortunately our time limit is up. Uh, and as we close this event, uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to invite uh, uh, my ambassador, distinguished deputy permanent representative of India, uh, Ambassador Tanmelal, to deliver the closing remarks. Sir. Respected Sadhguruji, Madam Tao Prochan Lynch, Madam Yoga Mata, honored guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. This has indeed been a fascinating and enlightening uh, discussion one that has shown that our ancient wisdoms continue to hold true in a modern world. It is clear that the solution to the multitude of problems that we have set out to address in the SDGs will come as much from the technologies of the future as from the science behind the traditions of the past. The complex and interlinked nature of the issues that confront us in achieving a shared prosperity for everyone while preserving and nurturing the health of the planet requires a distinct shift in the global consciousness. An understanding that pockets of prosperity amidst a sea of despair is unsustainable. A recognition that our well-being is clearly interdependent on each other and with that of the nature itself. Today's discussion shows that the philosophy and the intellectual tradition of yoga is intrinsic to and can be an important catalyst for such a shift in global consciousness. Yoga is a manifestation of the values of mindfulness, moderation, and oneness of being and nature. Modern science is only now discovering the interconnectedness of cosmos, a fundamental truth known to the yogis since long. Ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed today in having benefited from the presence of distinguished yoga masters. Sadhguru has brought out how much the practice of and philosophy behind yoga can contribute to addressing the common challenges that we all face. He has provided deep and striking insights about how yoga must be understood and how it may be put to service of sustainable development. The remarkable Tao is a true emb embodiment of the phrase, youth is but a state of mind, and a wonderful testimony to the uh, transformative potential of yoga. May I now thank all those who joined us today, starting with the two yoga masters, our valued guests, USG uh, Mr. Vijay Nambiar, 
distinguished permanent representatives, and other special guests who enriched the discussion with their personal experiences and thoughts. I would like to place on record our deep appreciation to the United Nations Department of Public Information for partnering us in this endeavor and to the UN Secretariat for their assistance in putting together this event. I thank also all the distinguished delegates and our guests from outside for their participation. Before closing, I would like to add that the UN building will light up again with yoga postures later this evening from 9 p.m. till midnight. And I would also like to remind that we will be commemorating the International Day of Yoga tomorrow at 1 p.m. outside the Secretariat building. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.